Live from the 607, it is the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour, where we're talking sports locally and nationally. Why don't you join in the conversation with the hashtag ODPH. Here we go. And welcome back to another edition of the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. I am your host, Ken M, and sitting across from me in the brand new studio is a sound guy galore, JR. Oh, you know I'm right here. To the right of me on the cell phone giving you the stats you need to know about, it's the intern himself, Padawan J. Hello, hello, hello. Now, folks, it is kind of a big episode this week. We're testing out some new equipment in the studio. So, via Skype... From a location we're assuming is somewhere near MetLife Stadium, getting ready for the NFL free agency's first day. He has been gone from the show too long. Folks, welcome back, Coach Duffy. Oh, everybody, it is nice to be back again. I can't wait to get this going. Absolutely. Great to have you back, Coach. And speaking of return guests, he was on for our NFL preview show. So we're talking some more NFL But he is also a NASCAR aficionado and a fellow Blue Shirt Nation member as myself. Give it up for the one and only Nostradogmus, Mr. Edwin Fortunato. Yo, what's up? Glad to be back. Thank you, dog. We appreciate you having on the show. Hashtag ODPH if you're on that social media. And let's get right to it. The biggest news story of the week has to be the NHL and the free agency moves that have been going on. And if you're a fellow Blue Shirt Nation member as dog and myself... It is a tough one to watch, but it's a necessary move. The New York Rangers have been making moves all weekend, and they're going right up to the deadline. Rick Nash is gone. Nick Holden is gone. Michael Grabner is gone. JT Miller is gone. And the captain, Ryan McDonough, is gone as well. And coming to New York is a bunch of number one picks, a couple of second-round picks, and prospects to be named later. The Rangers have re-upped. For moving forward, and next year's draft is going to be amazing. Thoughts from the panel on this one? Well, I know having had conversations with you in the past, you know, especially when the Rangers were making their Stanley Cup Finals runs, that you were saying, you know, their run and is real limited. The window's real short on these guys. So, I mean, we kind of saw it coming eventually. Yeah, I mean, it was definitely coming. It pains me to watch because for being a Rangers fan as long as I've been, Henrik Lundqvist deserved a cup. In, during this run. I don't know if he's going to see one in New York. And it's a sad thing for me to say. Because obviously if you're rebuilding, the chances of turning around you know, 0-100 to 100 and getting to the Stanley Cup Finals in, in a year like if they're making as many moves as they're doing right now is tough. It's not impossible, but it's going to be very tough. I mean, not everybody's going to be able to do this like Vegas is doing, which for an uh, expansion franchise is setting records all over the place. But... With the Rangers, yeah, it, this is tough to watch. But it's a necessary move. They needed to do this. I mean, the window has been getting shorter ever since. I mean, they got to the Cup against the Kings way back when. And even last year going up against Ottawa in the playoffs. I mean, that was a series they could have won and they didn't. And it's tough to watch and see from my point of view. Dog, you have any thoughts on this? I think it's, yeah, like you said, Lundquist has done everything. And it's just, I wish he got a Cup. Helping out, but it's just, I think they had to do it moving forward. They had lots of different contracts and everything, and I, I think it was just time to move on from a lot of guys. I mean, they talked about trading Nash for a couple of years now, so it's... Yeah, that's no new, no new news. Yeah. I know they've been talking about that for a while, and especially when they get a big, big-name big free agent to come to town. I mean, everybody thinks that that's going to be the, the piece to get more of the, of the puzzle, you know, to... Get him over the hump. It just hasn't worked out. Coach, you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, I just think it's uh, I think it's tough because, I mean, this team obviously just four years ago was making a run into the Stanley Cup against the Kings that they just didn't have, in the, you know, the, the uh, goal scoring to put them over the hump in that series. And, I mean, now you talk about this offseason, they make one trade, you know, trading Stepan, which was a big risk, mm. you know, but you definitely didn't think that just trading one, you know, first line center you know top six center you know was really going to make them regress this much I mean obviously I know to me a lot of it falls on Vignon uh AV you know the head coach of the Rangers I feel you know his um uh holding back of the younger talent has kind of uh diminished this team's returns what they got in that trade 
from uh, Arizona. And not to mention, you know, Zabenajad being hurt uh, and Chris Kreider being hurt and Shattenkirk not really panning out. You know, it's been it's been a year where they've had some swings and misses that you, you'd hate to see the fact that it's like, all right, now we got to blow up ship because, I mean, really this team was probably a top six forward away um, from really making some headway. And, I mean, obviously defensively, that's always been an issue for the Rangers. You know, they, they've never really had any great production from a, from a defender since probably Brian Leach. So, you know, seeing McDonough go, you know, really hurts as far as a fan. I'm more upset about JT Miller getting traded. That was a surprising honestly, move. I I know. And I, I mean, to me, honestly, Miller fit, you know, New York. He, you know, he's a USA guy, Team USA guy. He, uh, same with McDonough. But, you know, Miller was a forward who played defense, played offense. And, you know, the problem is, is that they needed him to play center. And it kind of regressed his skills because he's not a center. He's a wing. And he, he, he flourishes in the wing spot, but they continuously put him back at a forward, or at a center spot, and it hurt his growth. And I'm, to me, that just falls on, you know, A.V. the most. Yeah, I mean, I think, obviously, if you're going to do some rebuilding, he's got to go next, too. So, <laughs> yeah, not a choice. See, I mean, it seems how New York's completely fire selling everybody. Do, do they do the king a favor and, and trade him so that he can go get his, get his trophy and then sail off into the sunset? I mean, you've, you've, got, the, you've got the backup. He's proven. He's younger. I hate faster. Say, do you I mean do, do you move him? Get I, what you can for him now and let him go get his crown. I absolutely hate saying this, but you, if he wants to, if he wants to get a cup, you gotta grant his wish. I mean, you you know, in New York, he's still beloved. Absolutely, no matter, no matter like, what happens, if they move him, uh, Henrik will always get that free that free cup of coffee. No matter when he comes to town, <laughs> walk into MSG, own everything. It doesn't matter. Everybody loves him. But do you, do you let him just go off? Give give a guy give a guy come on give him his crown. I would if say it's not going to be in New York. This pains me as you can hear because I I hate even thinking of the notion. But if if it was what he wants, and I mean he has done everything he can do for the Rangers. I don't think there has been one guy that has been this consistent to to keep him in the playoffs as he's done, and in, throughout the years. He has been as solid and elite as you can ask for a goalie to be. I mean, he's been absolutely out of his mind in the playoffs. You know, the saves he made, they were just insane. Yeah, I mean, yeah, a couple, you know, bad games, but every goalie does. And, I mean, we've, oh. we've, we've even watched, you know, at, during games last year, I mean, we're watching the defensemen certainly aren't doing him any favors when they're no. passing the puck right in front of him, and you know, <laughs> you're asking him to make all these crazy saves, and you're like, listen, man, he's doing a pretty, you know, all things considered, he's doing a pretty damn good job. But when your defense is giving you no help, you're, you're one guy – you're struggling. Too, yeah, yeah, I mean, come on. Yeah, you, you can only do so much. Not to mention, I mean, the year that he played almost, you know, three fourths of the season's games. I mean, he literally carried that team on his back, you know, into the playoffs. So, I mean, yeah, you gotta, you hate to see the veteran go like that, but at the same time, it's like, you know, you want him to win a ring. He deserves one. You know, he deserves to hold the cup. But I, I don't know if he wants to go anywhere, though. I mean, I know that there's been talk of him getting traded, but. I don't. I don't know if he wants to go though. I think he loves New York. I think he loves being the king, and I think he loves that the moments that he gets there. Absolutely. So, although he doesn't have a ring, do they hang? Do they hang his jersey in the Raptors? Yes. Yes. Oof. That's that's what that's when I was waiting here for the coach. That 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 takes a lot though. I mean, to, to get that's, your number in the in I the mean, Raptors with no title. I mean, to, that's that's in, and that's just not any arena. This is MSG. Right. You know? So I mean, those are some, Rangers. Rangers that get retired are a big deal. You know, I mean, they don't they don't just retire everybody's jerseys. I mean, Messier, Leach, Graves, you know, they 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 hold on to that retirement ceremony. Richter, they hold on to it very very seriously. So I mean, to say to not have any Stanley Cups and be, you know, yes, I I don't know. He he might he might it's fifty fifty on me. This this will fifty fifty. This is this is the true test to see how much New York really loves him. Do do they put his do they put his jersey in the Raptors? Like we love you. You did what you could, but you didn't give us a ring. Do you still get hung in the Raptors? I I say yes because of the body of work. I mean, here's the thing. Did he did they bring home a cup? No, but you know what? He got them in contention so many years. Yeah, but. Contention is not a ring. No, I know it, it's yeah, it's, but... it's it's a it's a tough argument. It is a really tough argument. I think so. I mean, but it's 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 tough. I mean, yeah, because he did everything he could, and I think if you're going to acknowledge, you know, just a, you know what a New York Ranger is, 
I mean, Henrik's got to be up there. I mean, it's not like he I, has 15,000 saves or anything, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> I, I think the dip, yeah, I think the thing that would be able to put him over the hump is the fact that he has uh, that he has the body of work. But, I mean, outside of that, there's nothing, you know, obviously he's not, you know, he's not Ewing where he literally had the team, you know, for years contending in championships like Ewing did, except he ran into the Bulls. You know, Lundquist mm-hmm. just had seasons where they fell short consistently you know yeah i mean and that's that's going to be the argument to the till they decide if they want to put him in or not it just all depends i mean who knows i mean if he sticks around next year and let's say they get lightning in a bottle no pun intended because of all the trades they've been making with tampa bay if he gets if he gets there you know even if he's the backup at this point which i man this is like the weirdest conversation to be having like for me it's just you know henrik has been my goalie for how many years now and just to see like you know as the team is in that rebuilding phase, just what happens next? I don't know. It's, it's going to be a lot to watch. I mean, I think he gets in, but I, I couldn't. I couldn't imagine the first time. You know, not saying that they will, but if they traded Henrik, the first time he comes to New York, not in a Rangers jersey, he'd still get a standing ovation. No, but yeah. I'm saying. No, but I'm saying he oh, starts yeah. like the the look when everybody be like, that's like if Ewing came. You know, like when Ewing would come back, like if he came back to the Garden. In oh like yeah, it's it, an, an Orlando Magic jersey or something. You're just looking, you're like that. It just doesn't look right. You're like something's I wrong mean, with this picture. It's just not right. It's gonna be weird. I mean, I remember when Callahan went a few years ago. It was yeah, weird. Came back that was Tampa. surreal. And same with McDonough. It's gonna be weird. You know, I mean, these guys have been Rangers their entire career. I mean, especially McDonough, considering they got him from Montreal. You know, for nothing. You know, they traded basically a, a can of paint up there. Yeah. And you know, we're able to get up, get McDonough. You know, I mean. So he's literally came up through the systems. And JT Miller, the same thing. You know, I mean, that's going to be real, real weird to see them come back. Um, and if you start talking about if Zicarello goes or if they move, you know, another one of those guys, you know, it's just it's always surreal to see them come back to the Garden. It's going to be definitely surreal to watch. I know there are some other moves going on, but, you know, we talk a lot of Rangers if we're going to talk on this show about it. Let us know on social media what you think. Hashtag ODPH. What do you think about the NHL trade deadline? And for the Rangers moving forward, what's the next plan in the future? We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. You're listening to the ODPH. Hey, this is Brian Wolf from Fair City Fire. You are listening to ODPH, the greatest podcast in Binghamton. Woo! Coming back for the second segment on this week's ODPH, and we got a little NBA news to talk about. Pad, what you got? Yeah, so during the Oklahoma City Golden State Warriors game over the weekend, there was a little bit of a brouhaha, kerskuffle, if you will, uh, involving Russell Westbrook and Zaza Pachulia. Now, Westbrook went up for a shot late in the game, you know, got tangled up with another Golden State player. And then this is, of course, this is based on how you see the play. Zaza Petrulia fell down on Westbrook. Now, the, we here at the panel have seen the clip. Do you think it was intentional or not? I don't think it was. Per, like, it, 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 it looks close, but I don't want to think that they would go that route. So I'm going to say maybe it wasn't intentional. Maybe, like, it was kind of just, like, confusion of where he was on the court. But I, I don't think it was intentional, but that's me. I mean, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna speak up as the biggest guy on the panel. Um, you don't fall down that easy. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, that, that was kind of the way. <laughs> like, I'm. I'm just saying, as the as the six five, borderline six six guy. Like, I mean, I, I feel like I've got a pretty good base as far as keeping my ground. It, it yeah. takes it takes more than a slight trip yeah. on a like. I mean, he didn't even trip on his leg. Really. No, I mean, no. Respo kind of like he's laying there. He's maybe on his foot, but. I mean, f- first of all, physics kick in. He's not gonna. So he, he's everything. He's gonna fall backwards, not forwards. He, a, he, B. He felt like his shoelaces were tied together. I'm. I mean, for me, I think the biggest thing is Zaza is known as a dirty player, and Kawhi has called him out on it before, and uh, Popovich has called him out on it before. So I mean, I, when I watch the play, my gut reaction is, you know, it looks like the back of his knee gets hooked, and it looks like he falls down. Now, did he kind of put a little extra weight down on Russ? That's probably where I would say that was a little dirty. I'll say after 
the game was over and the video was making its rounds on the internet, both Kyrie Irving and Isaiah Thomas commented on, uh, I believe it was two different posts from SportsCenter on Instagram. Uh, essentially, the safe for work version is saying uh, NBA needs to look into this. Now, Dog, you are an Oklahoma City Thunder fan, true and true. What is your thoughts on this? I honestly didn't see the the play of controversy. I was, um, I didn't actually see the game the other night. Okay, but c- celebrating my nephew's birthday, or whatever. But shout out to him. Um. I mean, it's Golden State, so it's, there's always going to be something with, I mean, Durant and whatever they were going at it again. So it's it's always going to be that rivalry that it's never going to end. And whatever. So, yeah, it's one of it's one of those things that like it's you know not necessarily on the same level as like a Yankees Red Sox, but did, there's been something added to that rivalry with. You know, uh, Kevin Durant going to Golden State. Well, yeah, of course. I mean, yeah, Durant and Westbrook, that's always going to be something. That well, not to mention good. the play <laughs> earlier in the game when uh, KD and uh, Carmelo got wrapped up in each other. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I saw, saw that they, too. Yeah. Even they got physical too. Yeah. I mean, so now it's the rivalry starting to spread from just, you know, it being the core group of uh, Oklahoma City Thunder players that, you know, feel like, you know, they were dumped by KD to now even the guys like Paul George and, um, you know, Carmelo are now even, you know, taking uh, taking on the rivalry too. And I think it's great for basketball to have uh, – I mean, I'm all for it. When they weren't talking, good. Don't talk to each other. I like it. That game on ESPN, on ABC that Saturday, that Saturday night when they first played each other the first time, I had my attention completely. I love it. I hate each other. Love each other, hate each other. I don't care. Just play basketball that way. Play it like it. Play it like it was back in the '90s. I'm all for it. I'm down with you on that. I mean, to see rivalries start forming again, that you know, really are showing the level of talent in the league. I think Golden State has been predicted to run away with the championship again, but it's good to see teams like Oklahoma City and Houston and San Antonio really kind of make their stamp that you know you're not going to get to the finals that easy. And I think yeah, that they, I- they need to do this. No, I mean, I think there needs to be – I think that's part of the thing that kind of went away, and I know people have talked about before, is that, you know, a lot of these players, have, it's turned from, you know, uh, to friendship you know, on and off the court versus, you know, back in Jordan's era when it was, you know, I, I'm friends with you off the season, but when we're on the court for these next 48 minutes, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not friends with you or you're not friends with me, you know, and I, I'm going to hurt you just as much as you're going to hurt me. And I think that kind of came away from the game when, you know, you had these guys who started to become friends. And, I mean, that's cool or whatever. But at the same time, let's have a little competitive spirit. You know, let's have let's have those bickers on the court. Let's have that scrap. Uh, I, I like it. I think it's great. Zaza's play was a little 50-50 for me. But, you know, Carmelo and KD getting scrapped up in the middle there, sign me up. Let's do it. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think that's something the game needs. Because when you show passion and you're really competitive and you can definitely tell it on the court – it, it, it goes to make the game greater because if you're just going yeah. through the motions like it's a job instead of a sport, you know, it just doesn't get anywhere well, I mean, and, for me know, anyway. And it helps for the casual fans who, you know, they watch the finals. They watch, you know, a big matchup every now and then. If they turn on and watch Sports Center or Fox Sports 1 or whatever and they see the highlights and they see, let's just put the Kevin Durant, Carmelo Anthony situation in the playoffs, it's like game two, game three or whatever, the Western Conference Finals. If if I'm if I'm a casual fan, not really interested in that series. It's not the NBA Finals. I'll watch the finals, but I see that happen on Sports Center. I'm like, all right, when's the next game? I got to see what happens because of this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. I mean, just just imagine seven games of that. Sign me up. I mean, granted, it turned into an absolute blowout, but you know, they'll win by 32 points. But as far as that in your face, you know, that Western Conference kind of bullying around, like we're not going to take your BS. You know, let let's go. We're gonna you know lay lay a, lay a hard elbow here, going to the paint. I mean, the Zaza thing, it's questionable. It, whatever, but you yeah, know what? As far, as far as the physical play, the true hatred between the team, especially when you know when you see Westbrook and Durant like one on one or something. Oh man, all for it, baby. That's what I'm talking about. It's what you want to see going into the finals, and you want to see that competitive edge come out of the teams because you don't want to see it just going through the motions. Because if it does, I mean, what's the point? There really isn't one. Let us know what you think, hashtag ODPH. But before we sign off this segment, Coach Duffy has to leave, take care of some business at MetLife. But, Coach, 
Why don't you fill our listeners in on what you got coming on March 10th, I believe it starts? Yeah, so uh, I got a great opportunity here to uh, color commentate for the BU men's lacrosse team. Binghamton uh, University first, represent. That's right, Bearcats. So I will be broadcasting uh, through ESPN3, which you can download uh, on your mobile apps or gaming stream systems. Uh, I'll be broadcasting the Binghamton-Delaware game. Uh, my first time broadcasting, doing color commentary, so we'll definitely see how it goes. Uh, you know, li- lo- lifelong lacrosse fan, so you know I'm hoping to have that come out on the game. So if you guys got a moment to tune in, uh, greatly appreciate you know ODPH Nation showing up and uh, helping out with the ratings there. Absolutely. So make sure mark that date on your calendar, March 10th, ESPN three. Coach, thank you for joining us this week. Oh, okay. Take care, guys. Thanks for having me. Talk to you soon. Absolutely. Coach Duffy signing off for this week's ODPH. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. We're now on iTunes. That's right. The Yosho Duro Parlay Hour is now on iTunes. So download, rate, and subscribe. Spread the word. And thank you for listening to the Yosho Duro Parlay Hour. I'm the street light guiding you home. Avoid the wrong step into the back for yet another segment on this week's ODPH, and there was some UFC action this past weekend on Fox. The card was on fire, and dare I say there was some fireworks in the main event. Yeah, just a few. If you did not catch the main event, Jeremy Stevens versus Josh Emmett. Jeremy Stevens with an impressive TKO performance. You knew somebody was going to get knocked out in that one, and the fight definitely delivered in round two. Yeah, if memory serves me, Michael Bisping uh, predicted as much. He's like, I'm not sure who, but somebody's getting knocked out in this fight. I guarantee it. Well, as we talked about on last week's show, we kind of thought the same thing. Yeah. Stevens has the experience. I mean, he's approaching Cerrone level in the amount of fights he's had in the UFC, and he's still relatively young (laughs) in fighter years. And he definitely showed up and wanted to make a statement for this one. Now, Josh Emmett was... Definitely up for the challenge. Don't want to get it twisted, you know, obviously the second round. But you knew when these guys were throwing hands, somebody was going to get caught with one. And Stevens definitely got him in the second round. And I know there was a little bit of controversy at the end, and I know we've all just watched the past or the fight on the past break here. So I want to ask the panel, the fight ended with Stevens knocking him on the ground and finishing with strikes, but not without a couple – Shots that some are saying were illegal to the back of the head and a grazing knee shot on the while well, Emmett was on the ground. I want to ask the panel, what was your thoughts on that, starting with Pat? I understand the issue people have with it. The knee, it looks like it hits, but to me it looked like it grazed. The, the elbows to the back of the head, to me it didn't seem like it was to the back. It seemed to me like it was in the back of the neck. Now I realize I'm not the common man. I don't really know that much for in-ring stuff to me back of the neck isn't really back of the head it's the back of your neck it's a whole separate thing but to me i was like eh, if it was if it was a little higher up on the back of the body i would have been like yeah okay you can't do that but back of the neck eh, to me it didn't really have much issue and just reading here i'm um off of espn just it, um they say that the blows to his head were Hard to quantify, so, I mean, he did get hurt with three fractures of orbital bone, but, wow. But was it enough to really say it was illegal? I, I think at that point he was already yeah in rough shape. And plus the thing, too, is he was trying to scramble on the bottom or d- yeah. defend himself. So it's not like he was he was in a, in a st- I want to say a stable position, but he wasn't exactly, you know, move or you know laying firm and taking shots he was trying to move and some shots did graze now i know the referee didn't call it so they don't have instant replay for that well they could have but the where were they fighting uh, florida florida the state of florida has adopted they said this, said this on the broadcast florida has adopted the new rules but they don't have instant replay if they had instant replay they could have gone back and rewatched this stuff and all that but for whatever reason be it the athletic commission's own decisions or whatever, they don't have instant replay. Yeah, I mean, and if you don't have instant replay, you can't really call it too much with it. I mean, I don't know. Like I said, when I saw it, I didn't think it was 
necessarily illegal. And it's one of those catch 22s because the fighter is still moving. Is it somewhere where he caught him? You know, well, I maybe, but I, I, I'm with you, Pat. I thought it was more back of the neck than back of the head. Well, and yours and my first reaction was, you know, we, you know, end of the fight. Oh, hey, great win for him. But, you know, we're talking about it, and then they're kind of discussing some controversies in Michigan. And you and I are kind of both like, wait, what? And we weren't sure what was going on until they showed the replays. Yeah, and especially, I think the only question I would have now, I don't think the knee was illegal because I don't think it connected. If anything, it it grazed, which if you really want to get technical, yeah. But I think at that point, Emmett was already finished in the fight. It was just a matter of, you know, the referee jumping in. But I can understand because the angle, the one camera angle looks like Emmett is a downed opponent opponent, and Stevens throws the knee. I just didn't think it connected. Or if, if it did, like, I don't really see where it did the damage. Now, this is just me watching at home. I, you know, have a very different opinion than probably most of everybody if they were at the fight. And, and if you're a fighter, you probably know different. But I'm just saying from my point of view, it didn't look like it did any damage. No. And, I, and by that point, I thought he was already finishing the fight. Yeah, that's kind of what I, you know, he already hit him. He'd already dropped. And in the heat of the moment, it's just it was his instinct to throw the knee. Now, it's not – I don't think there was any thought process going through his head of going, oh, he's down. I'm going to throw this illegal knee. No, it's just it was down. It was what his instincts told him to do. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you want to go in to finish the fight, and he wants to make a statement because at 145 is now becoming the deepest weight class in the UFC. Yeah, just a bit. Well, it's arguable with 155. I I still think 155 is the biggest, deepest pool in the UFC. Yeah, you can make that argument. I, I, I can see that side of the perspective. Yeah, and I think that's going to be the question moving forward because obviously we're going to talk about at the end of the show about the UFC pay-per-view card this weekend. But overall, I thought Jeremy Stevens did enough to garner at least a possibility of a title shot down the road. Yeah, you, he's certainly in the conversation. That's There's no doubt about it. Yeah, absolutely. And also some other great fights on the card. Jessica Adrande, I, I hope I pronounced that right, uh, she took it to Tisha Torres and definitely made a statement off. I mean, it was just a heck of a finish for her. Oh, yeah. If you don't know her name before, you should now. Yeah. I mean, it was by decision, but she definitely made a statement in that fight. And you got to think it's got to be off for a title shot down the road as well. Probably the biggest surprise of the fight for me anyway was Il Latifi versus Ovin St. Peru. Yeah, that one was a bit of a surprise because what was it? He submitted him, if I remember right. First round submission. And, it was, and he didn't tap. It was... No, he just the, the ref goes. Oh, he's out. Yeah, he was out cold, and I honestly didn't think I did not see that one coming. And I'll admit I didn't. But hey, that's why you go into the cage and whoever is the better fighter that night wins. Yeah, and Latifi definitely showed something there. Albeit though, when he was calling out DC at the end, he's got to win a couple more fights before he get a title. Yeah, because going into the fight, Latifi was the eighth ranked fighter in that division. If I'm not mistaken, uh, you need to fight a few more fights and move up in rankings a few more. Absolutely. I mean, he's definitely in the talk now, but I think oh, yeah. you got well, yeah. to give him somebody maybe in the top five because he was, I believe, ranked number eight going into this fight. Yeah, yeah. you can't exactly have your number at, at the time, and I don't think the new rankings have come out yet, so you can't. I, I don't think there's exactly a reason that you can even explain to have your number eight fighter fighting your champion. I mean, I, I know we've had conversations about the UFC ranking system and how much it matters, Um but, yeah, even with that said, having your number eight fighter fight your champion makes no sense whatsoever. Absolutely. I also was reading, uh, aside from this aside from this card, did I also read that Rockhold now is going up to light heavyweight? Yeah. He's, yeah. Going to, he's making the jump to 205? Makes sense. I mean. Do we get a, do we get a DC Rockhold fight there? No. No. I don't think so because, obviously, they've been in the same camp for years. And it's one of those. I I just don't see him doing it unless DC is gonna jump to heavyweight, maybe just well, to get he, out of the division. He, well, no. He, well, I mean, there's really nothing left for him at light heavyweight. Rockhold. No, that's not even. That's not a fight for him. I think though, depending on what happens with the Miosic fight, I think it's gonna kind of tell a lot. And obviously, with a hearing with one John Jones coming up this week too, that could also play a factor in DC's future plans. We don't know. But it's going to be interesting to see with Rockhold up there. I was going to say, just with Rockhold there, how, how do you think he's actually going to do at 205? I think he'll be think okay. He'll look, you think he's going to look all right? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's, that's quite the jump, though. He's a skilled fighter, no matter what you you know you want to say. 
he can definitely hold his own up there, and plus, I think he'd be a nice shot in the arm at 205. So who's his, who's his first fight at 205? Glover Teixeira. Yeah. That, that, Welcome um, to the division. I would. <laughs> Here you go. Just, I'd put him against Glover. Teixeira. That, go nuts. That won't necessarily move the meter for your casual fans, but for those of us who typically, if we can, watch every card, yeah, we'll see that one. Well, I would say either Teixeira or why not Latifi? Latifi wants a good challenge. Rockhold is former middleweight champion coming up. That's a good fight, too. It's got to be kind of tricky to see where he lands up because I don't, I don't think he's going to get a top five opponent coming out the gate, but he's going to get a definite top ten. Oh, no, for sure. I, I was just kind of curious how you think what do you think as far as the jump up in weight. I mean, it's a good 20 pounds. It's a good 20 pounds, but I'm sure he cuts down to get down to that weight too. So, Ooh, sure. But I think for him, I mean, obviously he's had a couple title shots and as champion he's won the belt. I mean, what else is there for him to do at 185? That's the question moving forward. And Gustafson, as I already called him out, too. Now, that is a fight to see as well. Yes. Yeah, Gustafson. I mean, because he has been the quiet guy in that division that, I mean, I don't think anybody really wants a part of. I'd no, say. probably not. I mean, I think after he's the one who you can argue defeated John Jones. Oh, yeah. yeah. You yeah. can yeah. argue that if you want. If you saw that fight, you can definitely argue that. Who knows? They were both pretty beat up and everything. I mean, mm-hmm. I... Aside from that, I know I'm looking forward to the card this weekend. Yeah, I'm actually oh. actually kind of even jumping that card because this means we're just one step closer to find to seeing Khabib, who I'm pretty sure, due to your sources, is locked away somewhere preventing injury. Yeah, as far they as are I know, locked away like oh, it, 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 they're, the, they're safe so far. No injuries have been reported. The so. latest update is everybody is still healthy. <laughs> Go ahead. Knock on any piece of wood you can find. Not that we're overlooking this card coming up on Saturday night. However. We're we're still being very careful because <laughs> we want this fight to actually happen. Absolutely, two twenty three. And you want to break down this card this coming weekend? Yeah. So we actually have the uh, we have the cyborg sighting. She's going to be the main here on UFC two twenty two this weekend against Yana. Exactly. Yep. Hope I can pronounce it. Th- I hope you can pronounce this one right. Kunitskaya. I hope sure, I, did I pronounce hope it. that's close. I mean, either either way, we're going to see. I mean, you get Cyborg. Hello, right there. I mean, it's yeah. not. Yeah. And I mean, Cyborg versus fill in the blank. Yeah. Always, yeah. always gonna, you know, because you're just looking for that knockout power. You're gonna see Cyborg come in there, lay some haymakers. Can't imagine this is gonna go all five. I will say this: Yana's gonna give Cyborg her biggest test. I think so. I think this is gonna go to at least the third, maybe the fourth. I still think Cyborg wins, but I think it's gonna be a lot closer than people think. I mean, definitely Cyborg is now finally getting some contenders at 145, and Yana is going to definitely give her a run for the money. She's out of Greg Jackson's camp, so you know she's ready to go. And being the Evicta champion, hey, I don't see it. You know, I could see Yana pulling this one off, but I think Cyborg is just too much at that other level that I think she's going to take this one in the fourth. I mean, honestly, I'm, I'm more excited for the co-main. The co-main that that one to that one to me even even if even as the common or casual UFC guy, I mean how can you go wrong with Frankie Edgar? Anytime Frankie Edgar is on a card, that's must watch TV. Main stage, co-main, it's gonna be pretty good. And I and I'll say this too because I know there was a little talk this week about Conor McGregor wanted to jump in and fight him, and they didn't get the deal done in time or or something that variation. I'm actually more excited to see Brian Ortega fight Frankie Edgar than I would Conor fight. How many Frankie. losses does Brian have? Zero. Zero. Ooh. And, Ooh 13 and 0 on the line there. And I tell you what, if he wins, it's a title shot. And I think if Frankie wins, he gets back Max Holloway in a title shot. And what I think, too, going off this past weekend, Jeremy Stevens should fight the loser of this one. And if Stevens wins, he should get the title, title. shot against whoever the champion is at that point. That is my opinion for that because I think that's a great fight for him. And plus this one, man, I don't know. I'll be honest. I don't doubt Frankie in a fight ever, but I tell you what, Ortega is no joke. No. And especially if you get in that third round, that's where I think Frankie might get a little worried because I think Ortega, if I'm not mistaken, I'm not looking at a stat sheet right now, has got the most wins in the third round in UFC history. Oh, Lord. Something in that variation. Anyway, he's a scary man in the third round. And now that he's in a – I don't know if this is a five-round fight. I don't think so because the belt's not on the line. No, and it's not a main event. No, but I tell you what, if it gets to that third round, that's where I get a little worried if I was Frankie. So I guess this is where you just hope that Edgar gasses just come out fist flying and then he just starts gassing in the third quarter – or third quarter, excuse me, third uh, third round there. He just 
yeah, when you're out of gas, you just come in there and start dropping bombs and take the win? There will be no chance of Frankie gas, and no, no matter what. But I tell you what, it's going to be a good challenge for Ortega, and if he wins, I can't argue a title shot. I can't argue one. that He is outright your number one contender if he beats Frankie. And if Frankie wins, he should get Max Holloway back. You know, when Max is healthy. I mean, Max, I think, doesn't care. He'll fight either or. The rest of the card is pretty stacked, so make sure to check it out this weekend. Hit us up on that social media, hashtag ODPH. Let us know your UFC predictions for 222 coming up this Saturday. We're going to take a quick break. We're going to close out with the local minute here on this week's Ocho Duro Parlay. <laughs> Hey, I'm Mike Pappy from Rye Bread, and you're listening to the ODPH. Coming back to close out this week's Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. But before we get into the local minute, there are some quick hits. We're going to take a quick lap around the bases. Starting with, this Friday is going to kick off the NFL free agency officially. I know that Roland Them Dice has got some blogs coming on the website, so shout out to Daniel John. He's got some stuff ready to come out for you starting Tuesday. But going into the free agency, there was one contract signing that, dare I say, took the panel by surprise? Maybe? Uh, Yeah, no, it did. Break it down for us, Pat. Back up the Brinks truck, ladies and gentlemen. Blake Bortles just got paid, and I mean that in all capital letters. Three years, $54 million, $12.5 million in incentives, which pushes the contract up to over $60 million. Good grief almighty. 26.5 of it is guaranteed, and he becomes an unrestricted free agent in 2021. Holy moly. Thoughts around the panel on this one? Um, surprised. Well, you know, when you lead the team into Pittsburgh and you get a big win in the in the uh, actually, let me back that up. When you beat Buffalo single handedly by yourself, let's recap that. Uh, yeah. Uh, let's see. He had more rushing yards than the entire Bills' offense. That was worthy of getting a little bit of money. Let's see. What else did we have? Then we go into Pittsburgh, ruffle Ben Roethlisberger's feathers again in an absolute shootout. And the Patriots game eh, wasn't the greatest game, but I mean, you're hey, you were you were one step away from the Super Bowl. You gotta you gotta give him something. Maybe not quite that much, but at yeah. least you gotta pay him. Well, the re-signing re-signing didn't necessarily surprise me because they had re-signed Coughlin. They'd re-signed their head coach to I believe it was two year deals or something to that effect. So re-signing Bortles doesn't necessarily surprise me because it seems like re-signing all of the core parts of. That team seemed to be the focus this week. But $54 million? Hashtag trust the process. It's working. <laughs> Hashtag. You've got, you've got the entire team. They're taking the Sixers approach. You, you can't ditch Bortles. Now, what, what are you going to do, Eli Manning? Like, well, I mean, if, you, if you didn't pay him, what are you going to do? Well, see, that's the question. And I would say congratulations to Blake on that contract. Hey, yeah. you know what? I, I can't be mad at you about that. But it's just surprising that he got that much for just – I mean, it's a great show of faith from the Jacksonville organization in him that he is going to be the guy for the future. But I just, I kind of just am very surprised at because, I, like we said, the Eli Manning talk was very, very loud this past season. Oh, yeah. Very loud. Oh, yeah. And with free agency looming, there are going to be some very capable starting quarterbacks out there that were better statistically. But, you know, true to the form, I guess when you beat Buffalo single handedly and you're the leading rusher on both teams. That's saying something. He did show that he can win a clutch game in Pittsburgh, which was a hostile environment. Say what you will about the game. He did, he, and they did play very tight up in Pitt, or up in New England, rather. So yeah, I mean, maybe he he showed that growth that showed him that he's going to be the guy to get him to the Super Bowl. I'm just surprised at it. I mean, that's kind of my biggest thing. I was more in shock about it. I yeah. Mean, I mean, I still feel like the contract, to a point, from upper management, is still has an asterisk though. Because it's not like you're the guy of the future, future asterisk now. Because mm-hmm. it wasn't like he got a big four, you know, like five, six, seven year deal where they're really going to make sure, like, you are our guy. We're going to continue to build around you. The defense has already proven that it's really good. The offense needs a few tweaking. We're going to get you a few weapons, and you're our guy for the next five years, and we're going to win a title with it. 
you you you're almost given like a time like you're given three years because obviously like I said the defense is proven. Yeah, they go out, they get a couple receivers, you know, make a little noise on the offensive end, and then now there's no excuse. So you've got three years to make this team get over the New England hump, so to speak, yeah. mm-hmm. and get to the Super Bowl because it's all there. And if you can't, then you're then you're out. So yeah. I mean, it's not like they were totally committed. That's why it's like you know you don't hear the big you know ah oh, we gave them the big four five six year, six year deal. No, we give you three. Yeah. You you have a time frame. It is now three years. We saw it. We've seen glimpses. And that's it. And I think that's the biggest question mark with him is he's got to be more consistent. By the and, way, we'll give you fifty six million dollars. Yeah, and, that doesn't that certainly yeah. doesn't hurt. <laughs> and, but this should be more motivation for him to be consistent. I mean, he he has shown flashes of greatness, of you know being that guy, and that's what I'm saying by greatness, of being the guy to lead him over the hump. Now, is he a Russell Wilson? Is he a, an Aaron Rodgers? Is he a Tom Brady? No, I don't think so. But is does he show that he might have the potential to get his team to the Super Bowl? Absolutely. The thing I still hate about it though is like so we get, so obviously he's got his extension, mm. fair enough. He's got his money, yep, which is great. Confidence in the organization, but yet you think about it, and I ask every one of you on the panel, do you still trust him in a playoff game? Can, yeah. do, do you really do you really look at him and go, okay, so this year, let's say you know this year they make it again. Obviously, let's say they win the division, they get a three seed, whatever the case may be, they repeat. Yeah, you say even they get a two seed. You you really gonna have faith? Can you really you know now believe? Blake Bortles can stand up against, say, an Aaron Rodgers in the Super Bowl. You know what? Do you really think of that kind of faith? Prior to last season, no. But, and I'll be the first one to say this, because I said on this show, if it came down to a shootout between him and Ben Roethlisberger, I'm going with Big Ben. Who won that one? Yeah, but Big Ben put no, 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 no. But who won? I'm asking who won the game. Jacksonville. And when he went against Tom Brady... I said, who are you going to go with is Brady. Now, Brady did win, but Bortles held his own. It wasn't great. It wasn't flashy, but he held his own. So so I ask you this. So the 100 in your pocket, you're going to throw it down, you're going to throw it down on Bortles to, to gunsling against the Tom Brady in the AFC title game this year? Probably not because. <laughs> and then, and here's the point but, right but there. I'm, but I'm saying this. You I, still don't I, have the I, faith in I, I would, Well, no, because I want to see more consistency. That's my issue. All right, is, Jacksonville goes 13-3. and three. They're the two seed. If if they go thirteen and three and they're the two seed and he has an MVP like season, then yeah, then I wow. would. But that's I don't know. but I want to see it. But I right, want to right. see it because here's the thing: he he showed up when he needed to show up, and you can't argue that. No, the playoffs, he was there, and that's why I said like, I I'm kind of saying like, do we do we consider him the same level of Brady and Breeze and no and no because we haven't seen it consistently enough. But if he this is like the the turning point. And in the playoffs, he showed he could do it. I mean, anything's possible. But if you're asking me, do I trust it right now? No, I don't. <laughs> but it's not to say if I don't see something. He does have the same amount of playoff ones as Dallas Cowboys in the last 20 years. Whoa. Oh. That is true. He went there. Spicy. That is very oh, true. But, mercy. <laughs> but you never know what's going to happen. Obviously, as you know, dog is now throwing stuff at me because thanks, I, thanks. I questioned it. <laughs> um, you know, it's going to be one of those scenarios that moving forward, Dallas could get over the hump too. I mean, Dak, we're going to see something out of too. Free agency is going to have so much to play into the team's futures coming moving forward. I, I still think you know what I I I understand Jacksonville giving the faith, and of course I want to see this happen. Minnesota go after Kirk Cousins, but I tell you what, I think they I think they made a huge mistake in not getting Cousins. I think I think he would have been your immediately turn that offense around right now. Yeah. Over 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 Bortles. Don't get me wrong. I mean, say say it what you will. Bortles, I, you can't lie. I mean, he did go into Pittsburgh and win a game, and he went to Foxborough and at least kept it semi close, at least a lot closer than we all thought. But I don't know. I'm I'm really excited because I really hope Minnesota opens up the checkbook for Cousins and really gets goes after and gets him. Because I tell you what, that that's a guy who needs to get paid. It's going to be a very, very unique free agency, and I think it's going to be one for the record books. But I tell you what, Bortles has proved us, proved me wrong, and has proved a lot of people wrong this past season. He can only do it again next season. Other interesting thing was uh, Russell Wilson participated with the New York Yankees in spring training, took a couple of grounders, took some batting practice, spoke to the team as a Super Bowl winning quarterback can. I know Dog's a big uh, Russell Wilson fan there. Him and Pitch Trips is like, sacrilegious or something for me it's just well, uh, fair enough i think he can gain i think he can gain some 
um, insight into different um, maybe helping the Seahawks do it. Just that having the being around that aura of the New York Yankees, and he's always dreamed about being in the pinstripes since he was a baseball player, Joe. So, hey, you know who knows? Maybe the spring training will actually uh, help him with that accuracy too. Ooh, oh boy! You never know. But speaking of some accuracy, I think there was some accurate driving this past weekend. Dog, you got some update on that? Yeah, Kevin Harvick uh, dominated both the Xfinity and Monster Energy Cup races at Atlanta, and now they head out west to start their. Um, they do a three race tour out west with Las Vegas, Fontana, and Phoenix, I believe. So, be some good racing to watch moving forward. And Josh, you got something this past week too? Yes, my Sunday was watching the final round of the Honda Classic. I was completely glued to my television all afternoon, watching and following the one and only Tiger Woods himself as he is running around the Honda Classic, shot even. Finished 12th, but, man, it looked really good to see Tiger in that famous red on Sunday. He's making some really good shots, too. Great to see him back. I think it's wonderful for the sport. And uh, we're looking to see uh, Augusta be coming around the corner. It's coming up very, very soon. So to close out this week's ODPH with the local minute, Pad, you got some Binghamton Devils news for us? Yeah, so uh, for the week we're recording, the Binghamton Devils will be playing Tuesday, February 27th at the Bellevue Senators. Then Friday at 7 o'clock, they are in Syracuse playing the Crunch. Saturday, they are playing the Phantoms. And then Sunday, they come back home at 5.05 against the Utica Comets. Comets, excuse me. So shout out to them. And uh, sad news to report with the Binghamton Bulldogs. The streak is over. Ugh. Scranton Shamrocks 120 and the Bulldogs 112 this past Saturday. Kyrie Sutton had 33 points with 22 rebounds, and David Hay had 23 and 4. So the streak unfortunately comes to the end, but still support them, Bulldogs, this past this weekend. They're playing March 3rd at Davis College, so they're not at Seton if you're in the 607 area. 705 start time. More information at BinghamtonBulldogs.com. And, of course, just a quick shout-out. The timer is on. The countdown has begun. We are 38 days away from Rumble Pony Baseball, baby. Yes. There it is right here. And you guys may actually be able to see Tim Tebow in single A, but you can see him. Oh, it's a long be, season. He'll be at double A, so we can't wait to see him here in Binghamton doing his thing. And also want to give a quick shout-out to Excite Wrestling doing their show March 2nd, American Legion Post 80, downtown Binghamton, ExciteWrestling.com, Twitch TV if you're not able to get to the Legion that night. It's going to be a great show if you're into pro wrestling. So definitely want to give a shout-out to Moose and Team Excite on that one. So that's all we got for this week's Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. So on behalf of the interim himself, Padawan J, Nostra Dogmas himself, Edwin Fortunato, Coach Duffy, who is at MetLife Stadium, and we are hoping to get some more word from him on Free Agency Friday. The Sound Guy Galore, JR. I am your host, Ken M. Thank you for listening to another edition of the ODPH. We'll see you next time.